Oh my goodness, uh, my apologies, my apologies, my apologies. My interview with the University of South Carolina went a little bit longer than I anticipated. There was a big back and forth, a big scuffle. We were just about to sign on the dotted line and we had a big impasse about putting and replacing the Gamecock logo with the uh, Voice of College football logo on the side of the helmets. So I don't know if that's going to get done because that's a sticking point with me. Mark Rogers, TV, the Voice of College Football. This is our Sunday night, late night call-in show at midnight or about 1210 Eastern time. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much, Will Muschamp. All right, we will talk uh, South Carolina football as well as anything else that you would like to discuss from week 11 that we've just completed or going into, of course, week 12 in a doubleheader matchup in the Big Ten that is huge between the four undefeated teams in the conference. Wisconsin Northwestern, of course, being the marquee matchup. And then those middling Ohio State Buckeyes and Indiana Hoosiers, the upstarts over there in the Big Ten Eastern Division. I will make my way through the live chat as I always do and will comment to anything that's reasonable, anything that's amusing, anything that's worth commenting to. I will leave alone your own little private conversations there in the live chat here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. I would love to be able to sit here and rattle off a list of possible successors to Will Muschamp, but I got to say that I found out um, maybe sometime late this afternoon that uh, the uh, defensive guru who gave up 59 points to Lane Kiffin's Ole Miss Rebels on Saturday night had been dismissed. I have not really had time to look into it. And I got to tell you, hey, it's, um, it's a good character point for anybody to know their limitations. And uh, just about anything under the sun concerning college football, I'm ready to take on. I have never been the best at who should be the next coach for Michigan. Who should be the next coach at USC? Who should be the next besides the obvious? If uh, South Carolina could lure Urban Meyer out of retirement, that would be a no-brainer. But other than him, in terms of looking at the coordinator level, again, I, I, I wanted to do some, uh, some fact-finding, some digging, some investigative work to see what was uh, what names were being thrown out there uh, because then they start to pop into my head after that. After I get uh, a couple in there and then I start thinking down that road uh, of who could possibly replace Will Muschamp at a school, at a program that is probably the most underachieving in the history of college football. Texas would be the most underachieving over the last 10 years. Texas recruits in the top five to top 10 in the nation, and they've been a 500 ball club for 10 years now. It's been embarrassing in possibly the worst league in America. USC has underachieved recently, of course. Miami has for about the last 15 years, considering their recruiting footprint. They've been marginal, winning 57% of its games over the last 15 years. But over the course of an entire program, when has South Carolina been truly, really a factor nationally, been relevant, been uh, a contender for national championships, conference championships? They've never won the SEC. They joined in 1992. They did make it to one conference championship game and were steamrolled by Cam Newton in 2010. What was the final score of that game? Like 56-29 or something like that. The best South Carolina football teams were the last few under Steve Spurrier. Those three consecutive 11-2 and two teams, but none of them won the division championship. Actually, it was a lesser South Carolina team that lost five games that went to Atlanta. So we'll talk to Will Muschamp in South Carolina. Will Muschamp will be a prized commodity as a defensive coordinator. Uh, I don't know what his buyout was, but uh, I don't think I did nearly as well. <laughs> I can tell you, uh, yeah, boy, I should not start down that road. Uh, during my recent, it wasn't a buyout. It was just, I'm gone, see you. Okay. And then, of course, the games. Let's talk the games. Let's talk the games. The hot button issues last night seemed to be Jim Harbaugh and 
James Franklin. People are ready to fire James Franklin. I don't in any way get that. Please check out our recent videos. We talked to uh, Husker hype Chris Wall about uh, Nebraska's first win of the season against Penn State. We also uh, posted the video. Oh, yeah, the top 25, that actually makes sense. People still don't get it. All right, the top 25, that actually makes sense, posted today as well as, oh, we had Sunday football. How about those UCLA Bruins, those fighting Chip Kellys with a big win over Cal, 34-10. Our guy, Tony Saracusa, came on from Last Word on College Football to break it down for us live from the Rose Bowl. And so we posted that video. Please pay some homage to the Rose Bowl and UCLA. Check out our video. Patreon, you get my predictions each week. And that is truly not the reason to go over there. But you do get my predictions each week. So anytime somebody asks me, hey, Mark, what do you think about the Purdue Northwestern game? Give us a, your prediction. Now, just a couple of years ago, I would have given all those Actually, all my predictions are posted right here, so you can verify my prediction numbers. They're all posted right here through the 2018 season. All my predictions, right on video, right here, all time stamped, so I can't hide. I can't make up any numbers. But to honor the people that uh, support me on Patreon, I have promised to deliver my predictions exclusively there. Also exclusive to Patreon would be our watch parties. And then also we've got uh, the exclusive live streams that we offer per request. We've done about 15 or 20 of those per request. And then we also have the insider look at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And uh, all that that is. Plus Steve Merrill comes on Pro Sports Info to give his Lock of the week. I didn't check on Steve's prediction from this past weekend. I'll have to give that a listen to see if he nailed it. We hope to be a regular on ESPN Radio Los Angeles here. I was told that they liked my first appearance on Friday night. It was so nice of uh, Scott Kaplan, former pit place kicker, and uh, ESPN, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> ESPN Radio voice. I didn't have one there. ESPN Radio Voice, I need some water. ESPN Radio Voice, Scott Kaplan, to find me on Twitter and invite me on Friday night. He said uh, everything went well, sounded good, all those good things. Also, want to let you know that uh, there's a site, and I should be prepared for this. It's called Something Cited. Ah, I posted this on Twitter. It's a very interesting site in which um, it's kind of like a Twitter looking thing where you post debate topics. Post debate topics, people vote, you can win money. Can't say that I know a whole lot about it, except I've been asked to join, and I have, and I've posted some debate topics there, like, does an undefeated Pac-12 champion make the playoff? And if anyone has a good debate topic for me to post for tomorrow, then I will post that tomorrow. If you're on Twitter, please join me there, Mark Rogers TV. Amazon. Shop at Amazon. All right. Let's see what you guys have for me. And we'll dive into Will Muschamp and the games coming up this weekend. Reasonable Gumps here. Not use Dexter. My apologies. My apologies again. The administrators at the University of South Carolina were adamant about keeping their logo on the helmets. I don't know that I can win that debate in replacing Will Muschamp. Voice of college football. One side, maybe, maybe we come to that compromise. We go with the Voice of College Football logo on one side of the helmet. On the other side of the helmet, uh, we stay with the Gamecock logo, the C. I think it's a C. C, S, to C. David Greenshield, Eli, college football fans aren't always rational thinkers. <laughs> you bet. What was South Carolina thinking when they hired Muschamp anyways? They were thinking defense. 
They were obviously thinking defense. We know that Mike Bobo, who was the head coach at Colorado State, is the offensive coordinator at South Carolina. Offense was certainly not the problem on Saturday night against Ole Miss, but it really is against Ole Miss. It was the defense. Reasonable Gump, they were thinking, hey, this guy's probably learned from his failures at Florida. Let's give him another shot. You know what? That's actually a reasonable thought from Reasonable Gump. Go look at Bill Belichick's tenure in Cleveland and his first season with the New England Patriots. You will see 5-11 and 11 show up quite a few times. Pete Carroll's stay with the New York Jets wasn't wildly successful. Then he went to the Patriots and they were good. He did get fired. He was the coach before Bill Belichick, but Pete Carroll had a nice run at New England. He was decent. They went to the playoffs a few times. Eli, I do think though that there are very few coaches who have unsuccessful stints somewhere before going somewhere else and being a success. Gene Chizik had a miserable record at Iowa State. Now, he didn't have a successful run in its entirety at Auburn, but when you win a national championship, that makes up for so much more, which reminds me, I'm going to be posting a Jim Harbaugh video. <laughs> I uh, gathered some thoughts on Harbaugh, which doesn't take a whole lot. Eli, why does the whole SEC East besides Florida and Georgia suck? Okay, Eli, compare the SEC East against just about any other division in college football. It's better. <laughs> How do you come to that conclusion? How do you come to that conclusion? Okay, Florida and Georgia are good. Okay, so that's uh, two teams right out of the gate. So you... You've got another five. Okay. You've got Tennessee. Who are they losing to? Oh, other SEC teams. Got it. South Carolina. Who are they losing to? Oh, other SEC teams. Uh, so, again, Eli, this is, this is an education in math, and it's an education in reason. All the conferences are playing just conference games. Therefore, every conference has the same composite result. We can't come to any conclusions about how good the conferences are based on the results. We can't. Can't do that. Now, if the SEC East was losing all the games to the SEC West, you could say, well, the West is amazing and the East sucks. And maybe that's happening. I don't know. We'd have to go through the whole deal. Georgia lost to Alabama. Florida lost to Texas A&M. But they won other games, obviously, against the West. And there are more games being played between the East and the West this year. But off the top of my head, I would have to consider uh, that the SEC West is still, I think it's weakened. Uh, LSU is certainly not what they've been, not just last year, but what they typically are. Auburn's not quite as good as they typically are. Not quite. Texas A&M's roughly better, a little bit better. Alabama's always the best or close to the best in college football. Ole Miss, Mississippi State, does it matter? Mississippi State's down a bit. Arkansas's kind of tough to, to really gauge them to a certain extent because they're so much better than they've been the last couple of years, but they're not as good as they were 10 years ago. Uh, so the SEC West is still the best division. By how much? Maybe not quite as much as it used to be. The Big Ten East versus the SEC East would be the next comparison because either one of them are the second best division in college football. One of those two. Michigan and Penn State are so bad this year that I wouldn't say uh, I would have to go with the SEC East, I believe, right now over the Big Ten East. The Big Ten West has no elites. There are no elite teams in the Big Ten Western Division, but I said a few years ago when Scott Frost went to Nebraska, and P.J. Flack went to Minnesota. 
And Wisconsin and Iowa being what they are year to year and Pat Fitzgerald doing a nice job at Northwestern that the Big Ten Western Division would be the most competitive in a quality sense, competitive division in college football going forward. The ACC Coastal is competitive, but it sucks. Now, of course, this year, the ACC does not have divisions, but I still look at it as divisions. I still don't look at Notre Dame as being in the ACC. They're not in the ACC. They are this year. So if you want to just rate the conferences this year, then you include Notre Dame, I guess, but that's going to be short-lived. Uh, the ACC has arguably been the worst conference since 2017, so 17, 18, 19. Certainly at the worst results. Yes, must champ back to defense for him. Weirdly enough, Muschamp actually got worse at Florida. He had good defenses. Yes, they had exceptional defenses at Florida, and he had one tremendous season. The 2012 Florida football team is underrated. I don't hear them talked about for two basic reasons. They didn't make it to the conference championship game. Oh, somebody's calling. Where's my phone? I thought I had my phone here, but it was my old phone. I will, I will take that call in just a second. My apologies. I had my old phone sitting here, and I thought it was my, my phone, so i got to go run and grab my other phone. Uh, the 2012 Florida football team, look them up. They played the most difficult schedule in college football. They lost one game. Toughest schedule in the nation. They lost one game, and they dominated that game statistically against Georgia, but they had one of those – Bad special teams, coughed up the ball constantly, outgained Georgia like four to one, a zillion first downs. Their defense gave up hardly anything, but they lost like 17 to nine. And that cost them a trip to the SEC championship game in which they would have been slaughtered. No, not slaughtered. Uh, Georgia wasn't slaughtered. Georgia probably played better than Alabama in 2012 in the championship game. But that was Will Muschamp's, that was his one chance for glory. Uh, but I will pick up that call in a second. Eli, didn't Florida didn't Florida lose to Georgia Southern back when they were still in the FCS under Muschamp? Well, uh, yes, the phrasing of the the question isn't quite right there, Eli. But I got you. Yes, Georgia Southern was not still under the FCS under Muschamp. But anyway, yes, they did. Yes, I think we're all in agreement that Will Muschamp will have no issue getting a coordinator job. But just think of the life that you have when you're making, what was he making, maybe $5 million a year, something in that range. And if things go wrong, you get a nice buyout of 10 to $15 million. I don't know what the reports are. I've not looked into this at all. All I know is Will Muschamp stepping down and Mike Bobo is the interim coach for the rest of 2020. But uh, so I don't know what the financials are, uh, but just just think about being able to walk away from a job, get handed 15 million. And if you were somewhat smart with your money prior to that, then you had, oh, my goodness, you would have to have tons of money in the bank. More people are calling me. Tons of money in the bank. And, uh, you know, you can live on a million a year, can't you? Do you think you could get by with that? I think I could scrape by. I would have to lower my standards here on YouTube, but I could scrape by on a million a year. And then if I'm making five, I bank the four. Of course, you got to pay taxes. I guess you have to. Uh, so so, you, so you, you make five, you keep three after taxes, and uh, you bank two million a year. You live on one. You bank two. You do that for five years. If you're the South Carolina head coach, you got 10 million in the bank. If you can invest just decently, you should be able to make 10 to 15 percent off of that. You're sitting on six or seven million in the bank. And uh, I got to think that you could pick up a little change on the side through speaking engagements and writing books or doing something. 
So it's not like you got to get right back to work. Now, most of these guys are a success. And yes, I'm going to say something that people are going to scoff at and laugh and chuckle. Will Muschamp is a success in life. Yes. Was he a success at South Carolina in wins and losses? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you elevate in your profession to the point of where Will Muschamp has elevated, meaning to a top 25 to 30 job uh, in a field of not just looking at head coaches on the FBS level, but looking at coordinators and coaches and going through the high school ranks and all those people, if you can elevate to where you're being paid in the top 10 to 15 or 20 uh, in the country and you're making $5 million a year, yeah, he is a success in his profession. Then um, you, you've you got the drive and you've got the, the type personality, the type A personality that you probably don't want to be sitting on the sidelines uh, long. Most of these guys get right back into it, even if they don't need the money. All right. Let me grab my phone. The, uh, the seven being larger than the six, right? Yeah, I didn't notice that. Okay. So we're here at 860-325-3687. Hello, it's Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, it's Mark. It's Bash. Hey, Bash. What's going on? Uh, I'm busy. Really busy 50 hour weeks, you know. 50 kind of man, I wish I could cut down yeah. to 50 hours, that would be phenomenal. Well, we'll see when you have uh, when you have to keep yourself in shape and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I do plenty of like watching your videos and stuff like that. So, hey, you know what? I'm not gonna trash on your schedule there. That's, that's a busy schedule. I get it. What you got for us tonight? All right, so I've been paying attention to you and Uncle Lou mostly, right? Okay. Um, and it's a good call. I, I want to touch on something because I was just watching right before you went live. I was watching your season is over because I just got off of work at like eleven o'clock. Yeah. Um, I was watching the your season is over, and when he was talking what, what, about the state. Oh, that's on Uncle Lou. I got it. I got it. I wasn't following you for a second. Yeah. Your season is over. That's a that's a segment. Yeah. You're telling me. It, okay. It, it, gotcha. Yeah. His, weekly videos. Okay. Um, he was talking about Penn State, right? Yep. And he was talking about how they are still feeling the effects of the Busky and Paterno stuff, which I guess trash talk, whatever, but like there's some genuine thoughts about that. Really what I want to take away though is he's talking about how great of a coach uh, James Franklin is. And while I do think he's a great coach, he's done a fantastic job certainly at Vanderbilt before. Is it just me or does it seem like he doesn't really know how to uh, manage a game down the stretch. <laughs> I mean, like, you're talking about the dude who, in the biggest game of 2018 against Ohio State, ran read option on fourth and five with uh, Chase Young at defense then, mm -hmm. right? You know, he, he had that touchdown at the end of the game against Indiana, letting Indiana go down the field and score a touchdown. Then it's overtime. And eventually win in overtime. And I'm watching this Nebraska and uh, Penn State game this weekend. And there were eight plays in the red zone, Mark. Eight plays. And they threw the ball all eight times. Plenty of time left. Devin Ford is still a capable back. And I was at the Ohio State Penn State game last year, and I saw Will Levis run all over Ohio State when he came in. When you use that quarterback draw, the QB power, why aren't you running the ball when you got time like that? You have the game on the line at the end there, and you're 10 yards from the end zone, and you just take four shots to the end zone that are basically prayers, hoping for either pass interference or a miracle catch. 
usually by Dachshund or Fryer Muse. I'm so where I'm getting at is really do you think that James Franklin is as good of a coach when you're talking about managing down the stretch as we try to give him credit for? So you're ready for my response, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I restrain from calling many people great at what they do. I think that's a, that's a pretty high level of praise. Great. When I think great, I think I, I, um, I use the term great meaning hall of fame. Like if I say that guy's a great football player, uh, I consider him to be a hall of famer. Uh, I don't consider James Franklin a great coach. I think he's, very good. He has a tremendous track record. To accomplish what he did at Vanderbilt was pretty remarkable. It had never been done, has not been done since. They've obviously taken a tumble since he left. Going nine and four, two consecutive years at Vanderbilt. Again, exceptional. James Franklin's, there are hardly any coaches in the country, aside from Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, the, the, the true greats that are good at almost everything. So take any job and there are different components to the job. You have to do A, B, C, D. Well, most people aren't like a 10 out of 10 in all those facets. They know their limitations in certain areas. James Franklin is a tremendous recruiter because he uh, is a very commanding presence. He engages with people. He engages with young people. He builds relationships. He's a very engaging personality and he's used that very well he knows football but he's not a great strategist he's not a great clock manager game manager that is not a strong suit at all he's he's another version of less miles in some ways uh he inspires his team they love him he shows them care and respect and they respond to that he's done well in building programs he built one at Vandy. He took a Penn State program that Bill, Bill O'Brien did a tremendous job bringing them out of the, the darkness and gloom of the sanctions and putting them in a stable place. But James Franklin elevated it from there. So he's a builder of programs, but he's not a strategist. He's not great. I don't think he's a fool. I don't think he's just incapable. But yes. So what you're talking about yesterday in Nebraska, and I didn't see that sequence, but Will Levis is a runner. He's not a thrower. He is not a great passer of the football by any stretch. Or if number one, he'd be the starting quarterback. He's not because Sean Clifford's not a great quarterback by any stretch. He's marginal. And if Will Levis can't get the job, then he's certainly not a passer. And I've seen him play enough. Yes, he's a running threat. Uh, also, I can understand Penn State not wanting to run the ball at the running back position because they've lost their two best running backs. They're down to their third and fourth running backs. Not that those guys aren't capable, but they are hurting there. I would have used Levis. Now, again, I haven't seen the sequence, but uh, Levis is a runner. Yeah, to throw four shots at the end zone doesn't on the surface seem like the way to go. Uh, the Trace McSorley play on fourth and five, yes. Uh, I, I remember there being specific better options that were obvious. I don't recall them. It's been a couple of years, but yes, I truly remember that play not being the play to run. Um, so I don't think James Franklin's a great coach. I think he's one of the 10 or 15 best in America right now. He's built, he's taken a lot of great resources and facilities at Penn State and done well with them but he has his weaknesses. So then when we're talking about Penn State, then, and you're talking about the strength and recruiting, is, is, do you think like James Franklin is kind of shot? Because the thing is, he's recruiting right now in, in the state of Pennsylvania, and he's not getting the best in the state of Pennsylvania right now. And, and that is just the truth. These top 10 prospects in Pennsylvania, not one of them wants to really look Penn State's direction. They want to get out of there. You know, I saw Julian Fleming out of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. the one receiver in America, just commit to Ohio State. Sure. In which he's not even like getting it. Like Jackson Smith and Jigba is getting in 
uh, yep. a lot more, you know? So you don't think pulling in top 10 recruiting classes is being a good recruiter at Penn State? I, I, I don't think that's, that's not necessarily where I'm going. Like, he was able, granted, because of kind of like violations with Micah Parsons, but he was able to steal Micah Parsons from Ohio State. Ohio State had Micah Parsons. Like, I don't know if you remember that or not, but yep. and he is was supposed to be the best defensive player in all of college football this year. I think people are starting to get turned off by Penn State. And what I'm mainly hinting at is I feel like this Penn State job at this point is not really where James Franklin should necessarily focus on. I, I he, he is a good recruiter. I think I, I saw USC in Arizona. I'm going to tell you this. I think Arizona, or USC is going to lose two or three games this year. They did not look good. And they certainly didn't look good against Arizona State. You know they're only playing seven. <laughs> yeah, I feel like they're going five and two at the season. I, I'm not even kidding. There's going to be an upset somewhere along the line. Sure. They're going to probably lose to Utah. Or, or well, I mean, I haven't Maybe. seen Utah yet. Nobody has. But I, I have higher expectations for Jake, Bet Jake Bentley and that crew. Um, a lot higher than most people. But regardless, I feel like USC is coming up. And if that comes up and all I would suggest is that James Franklin at least thinks about going out there, trying to revive, revive them, kind of like he did Penn State, and it being a new brand like Penn State was back in 2016 when it got Saquon Barkley in there two years prior, when he got guys in there like KJ Hamler, Micah Parson, etc. You get what I'm hinting at there? That's my take. I got to go. Um, thank you. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Bash. So the last thing I'll say about James Franklin, because I forgot there were so many points in there that I forgot everything I was going to respond to. Well, just because a coach's team gives up some game-winning drives at the end, name me a coach whose teams haven't given up game-winning touchdown drives. So where James Franklin screwed up against Indiana, and this may have unraveled the entire season for him. So Penn State might not be that bad of a football team. Let's understand that sometimes seasons go sideways and there are teams that lose game after game after game, and there's a breaking point, there's a tipping point, and that's possibly what we've seen with Penn State. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? The voice of college football, Mark Rogers. This is Dave Show. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, David. How are you? I'm doing excellent. I uh, forgot to ask you, are you on uh, Mr. 16 and 4 again this week, or how'd that work out? Uh, I think it was 17 and 1. I think that's that's what it was. You, you went seventeen. Uh, you're, you're kidding me. Uh, I I don't know what the record was. It wasn't good. I I got screwed out of two half pointers, but uh, yeah, something like that. And Will Muschamp couldn't hold a man. He couldn't hold a. Uh, let's see. They were getting like ten and a half, and he was up a touchdown in the fourth quarter. My goodness, I was up by eighteen points. He gave up twenty one. I think. But uh, anyway, whatever the no, final I, record was, I, I don't recall, but uh, it wasn't good. Like six uh, and eight, okay. six and eight, something like that. Yeah, I don't know I what my, get... I don't know what my money line uh, number was, but um, it's always been my thought. And I know you didn't ask for this, but it's always been my thought that picking games against the spread is even though I do it as well, I, I take part in it as well because people want to hear it. I think it's just kind of a stupid, I, 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 I just think it's idiotic, but, it, but it's a creation of Vegas and betting. But basically what matters? The only thing that matters is who wins the games. And therefore, uh, and I know that's much easier to do, but then the bar which should be deemed higher. Like I hold a bar for myself as 60% against the spread and 80% uh, against the money line. But uh, if people didn't care so much again, uh, about the pick against the spread, I would be more into, you know what? I will, I will uh, be the guy that you can go to, to tell you who's going to win the games, because that's what matters. Who actually wins the football game, not who can, because that, that actually, that actually speaks more to your expertise of just determining who's going to win the game, not 
is oh. somebody going to win by 11 points or more? Because you don't know what's going to happen in the fourth quarter during garbage time. Sure. So anyway, that's sure. that's my okay. rant about gambling yeah. and how stupid the whole process is. But I take part in it, and I find it interesting. Well, I, I find it to be a, a fairly good money maker, as does the rest of the population. So that, that's why I enjoy it. I was fortunate enough to go to you know, yesterday. So nice. I took uh, Wisconsin as a, as a favorite, and yep. then I took uh, Illinois as a dog. So I'm, I'm oh, okay. Happy, so. Good stuff. There you go. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, you were talking about the Franklin situation, and I do find it an interesting situation there this year. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, college football fans are not uh, rational folks. As I once said, it was, it was once stated to be, remember, fans to be short for fanatic, it is not short for rational thinker. Um, so I do think, you know, with this situation there, kind of look at it, his tenure, you know, when he first started off, Taking over for Bill O'Brien, I, I thought the first couple of years he would saddle with a quarterback that he wasn't necessarily comfortable with, and Christian Hackenberg. It wasn't his guy. Yep. You know, and it, it didn't necessarily work out those first couple of years. And then I thought once he got the McSorley Barkley situation kind of cranked up there, he had a really good two, kind of three year run. In fact, I think his 17 team was a legitimate, maybe top five type football team that year. And, you know, they lost, what, two games by a combined four points. I mean, that was a legitimate playoff team, I think, possibly, in 17. You know, they had Barkley, they had McSorley, they had an NFL tight end, and NFL wide receivers. They were, that was a legitimate type team. Uh, but they just lost two heartbreakers. You know, J.T. Barrett chose had the best game of his life that day for Ohio State, a lot of the best games of his life. And, you know, they blew a big lead in that game, and then they lost that tough one to Sparty. Uh, I, you know, I still say this about their situation this year. I'm not saying that the, the losses of Parsons and then the two running backs are exactly what, you know, why they're at, where they're at. But I would say if you lose a Micah Parsons, who's probably going to be the best linebacker in the country, and then you lose your two starting running back, I would think that that would have some negative effect, even on programs that recruit at a higher level than Penn State. Wouldn't you say? So Ohio State's going to go into the season minus, minus, who's their best defensive player? Who would you say? Well, I mean, a lot of people would have said, like, Sean Wade coming into the season. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an equivalent, Mark. I think our defense in 2018 suffered when we lost Nick Bosa. I'm not going to say we would have been better. Well, I will say, if Nick Bosa never would have gotten hurt in 2018, I think our defense would be a lot better. There you go. In Nick, in in, in, uh, in uh, 2018, 19, <laughs> I'm like back a decade. Right. Uh, 2018, Ohio State loses uh, Nick Bosa and J.K. Dobbins and Mike Weber. Right. And and you there you go. I don't know. Right, because I mean that was—I mean that's what I'm saying. Even a top notch. Now in 2018, we were carried really by Dwayne Haskins on. So I mean, we had a quarterback that threw 50 touchdown passes. So I mean, that kind of carried us through, you know, a lack of a running game and a poor defense. So, but I, I'm just saying in general terms, if anybody loses their top two running back and a star defensive player, I mean, it's going to have a negative effect on the record. It just is. Well, Dwayne I mean, Haskins might not have thrown a seven or eight interceptions that year without two running backs, he might have thrown 15 or 16. Well, that's true. Maybe. That's true. I mean, maybe. maybe. But, yeah, I, I think these losses were unfortunate for him. And I'm not saying right now that that maybe be a 3-0 football team uh, that, you know, they'd be undefeated if they had those guys, or even 2-1. But, you know, or I guess it would be 2-2 two two right now, or maybe 3-1 right now, because I think they played four games. Pardon me, but, you know, it's eventually, I mean, you lose that type of talent, it's just going to have an effect on you. Absolutely. Yeah. I, don't I, I was working hey, on some I, math, I, David, while uh, you were talking there, because we had a conversation, I believe it was last night, about um, Michigan's uh, recruiting rankings under Jim Harbaugh and how they compared to his team's final rankings. Yes. So do you want to hear these? Since 2015. So his first class was 2015. Uh, yeah. Even though, you know, it's always difficult for that coach that's coming in late 
to try to pull in and keep people and all of that. So uh, his 2015, starting with 2015, his rankings uh, are 37, 8, 5, 22, 14, and 8. That's an average of 16. Okay. So I think that's pretty much on par with his performance on the field. Well, I mean, what, what I was indicating, though, also, now I do think he's had some laws in the teams where they've had more talent than the team they play. Now, so a lot of them have had, <laughs> well, that's true. But I mean, I, I think that there, I mean, there's a feeling out there that, okay, he's beating the teams that he should beat. But he's, he's losing to some teams, even in past years, where he had better talent than that. I mean, there's some losses in there where he had that, like last year, I thought he had a better roster than Wisconsin, and Wisconsin dump truck them in Wisconsin. Wouldn't you have said that going into that game? Yeah, but Wisconsin, I don't know how to rank Wisconsin and all of that because Wisconsin beats everybody. It beats a lot of teams, I should say, that have better talent. They're, you almost have to throw out Wisconsin's recruiting ranking. Not that you can. They're, they're, they're operating under the same rules as everybody else, but they don't play to their recruiting ranking. So they're beating a lot of teams that are better than them or supposed to be better than them. Uh, has Jim Harbaugh actually, if you just looked at recruiting rankings, that's all. Sure. Let's throw out this season. This season is a dumpster fire, and we can't throw it out eventually. But for argument's sake, we're taking his first five seasons, 2015 through 19. I, I'm just not – I guess I'm not understanding. If he's losing to all the teams that are better than him, he's always losing to Ohio State and Penn State every other right. year, and he's losing to Alabama and all those games. Well, he can't be losing too many games in which the teams are – or worse than him, or he wouldn't be winning 70-some percent of his games. Uh, he was 47 and 18 before this year and 32 and 12 in the Big Ten. And five of those 12 losses were to Ohio State. Um, and, and so I, 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 don't think he, I don't think he lost any more games to inferior teams than Urban Meyer did at Ohio State. Well I, well, I would throw this well. Uh, Urban Meyer, obviously, the interior loss of 17 and 18 by Urban to Iowa. 15, 13, yeah. 14. Urban lost to games every year. 15, 13, 14. Urban lost a game every year to an inferior team. Oh, sure. Sure, Virginia Tech, you, even the national championship here. You know, you go back to, yeah. I mean, you, you find Michigan for, State. I'm not, I'm not, sure, sure. Well, I would say Michigan State in 15, not, not Michigan State in 13. I think they were. I think Michigan State in 13, that was kind of a close time. That, that was the best San Antonio team probably ever. Sure. So yep. that was a that was a that was a lot closer talent matchup, I think, in 13 than it was in 15, I would say, wouldn't you? The 13 team is better than the 15 team. Yes. Right. Right. That, that's that's right. Yeah, for Sparty. Yeah. Yeah. Um the, the one thing though, is this goes back to the base podcast. This is what I was also gonna bring up. Because Dave brought this up. Like, what was the stat that he had mentioned over, like, Harbaugh's class was the 10 to 12 loss, uh, 10 to 12 losses, like, six or seven of them have been, what was it, like, 17 or more points, though, or something like that? Yeah, recently. So, was it so it's not that he's not getting, he's not, he's losing to the team for four counts. He's also getting beaten by those teams by a fairly large margin. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything in, you know, moral victories. I mean, would they feel a lot better if they were losing those games by seven to ten points as opposed to twenty or thirty points? You know, you go both ways on that. But still, he's also getting you know kind of dump trucked by some of these teams with better talent as well. I think that's a fair point. I think that's significant. Now, um, I think that that uh, maybe over a course of a long period of time, uh, let's say he was always losing these games close. They were close. Now that gets that gets worn out after a while, but I think that's a defense for a, a a period of time to say, well, let's give them some time. They're close. He's right there, uh, rather than right. if if they're continually as they have recently in this ten and nine stretch that goes back to late twenty eighteen, getting dump trucked. I, I think that's valid. That well, they're they're not even close in these games. So I think that's valid. Okay. 
Clemson beats Notre Dame. Yeah, in a Flo close game. Florida beats and, Alabama. Yeah. Right. Ohio State's undefeated. Yeah. You have an undefeated Pac-12. Sure. Who are my teams, or who are they going to select? Yeah. Well, give me both if you, if you want to go that route. I'm going to select, again, not necessarily the four best teams, but... I think that we play conferences for a reason. At least I would like okay. to hope so. I'm picking the four conference champions. You didn't even you didn't even weigh in on the Big Twelve. The Big Twelve champion could have one loss. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if the Big Twelve winner could end up with two losses this year. Well, of course they could. But I'm but I'm yeah, saying I'm just right. I'm just making your your scenario more difficult. Right, right. Well. I you know, I just wonder how the committee feels about the, about the Pac-12. I mean, it's, you know, I think that they think of them not as, if they do as many as the upper tier conferences. Plus, you know, they're not going to have the games either. So, and let's be honest, I mean, Oregon is not necessarily dominant. And two of has been fairly fortunate to win their first two games. Yeah, for as much so, as I would like to go just by the records, uh, this is a season in which, more than ever, I believe, we're going to have to go with uh, a measurement of dominance. Okay. So the eyeball test and, and, and looking at press and victories is probably going to be more, more important this year than it has been in years past. Yeah, lot. depending on how you define eyeball test, I don't see it as an eyeball test. I just see it as, okay, this team okay. is, if USC continues to win, like they have the first two weeks of the season against what, unless we are completely shocked by the Pac-12, the teams that they're beating the last two weeks and will continue to go forward beating, that's going to be a mishmash of teams. I expect the Pac-12 outside of Oregon and, to, and, and possibly USC to be just beating each other back and forth. Uh, they're going to have wins against a lot of three and four, four and three, two and five teams. Um, See, if Florida beats Alabama, Mark, yep. both are getting in, I, I would say, bottom line. Both are getting in. Oh, so, I, and then if Ohio, what's that? Then why doesn't Texas A&M have an argument? They beat Florida head-to-head, -head and they've only got one loss, too. Y yeah, but uh, you know how the committee's going to look at, at Florida beating an undefeated Alabama. And, I mean, Florida's loss to Texas A&M was like three points to the gun. It wasn't, yeah, but Texas A&M you know, beat them. Then, yeah, I know. Florida's loss to Texas A&M was like three points. I know. But Florida Reg beat, regardless, beat Alabama. Sure. What's that? But Texas A&M beat Florida. I would throw a fit if I was Texas A&M, if that happened. I'd say, we beat this. We play in the same league. So we're playing the same. You could probably even with this uh, schedule being expanded to 10 games and more crossovers between East and West, uh, by the end of the season, we could probably match up Florida and Texas A&M schedules, and they would have a lot of overlap. Plus, Texas A&M, I don't, I don't care if they beat them by 50 or beat them by three. They beat them. I would throw a fit if I was Texas A&M and say, we get the same resume as Florida, and we beat them head-to-head. -head. Uh, does that not count? Why does that not count? <laughs> Well, they're not going to. So you're saying that they should leave Alabama out then and, and just and take, take the 
damn Florida then. At that point. I, I'm just saying I would throw a fit. No, but then Alabama's got the. Uh, I, I'm just basically saying it's a mess. I, I'm not saying there's right. there's there's an argument in all directions because then if you leave out Alabama, then Alabama says we beat Texas A&M by four touchdowns. <laughs> right. Well, and then the team that's really going to feel bad luck is Notre Dame who thinks they've got the best win of the year so far, and then the next time they play Clemson, as I say, let's say if it's a touchdown or less in the game, and they're like, oh, okay, so we beat Clemson, we play them again at full strength on a neutral field, and only lost by seven points. So they're not exactly going to be feeling great either. Yes, uh, Notre Dame may find out this year why they don't play in a conference. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But I think uh, Florida has the best argument in all of that because, to me, they are the conference champion. Why have conferences and why have a format that determines who the champion is of the conference? Okay. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. I mean, I, I, I still kind of think Texas A&M is it, in the thick of things. But the one thing I would say about Texas A&M, I, I mean, if they would have played Alabama a little bit more competitive, sure. I would feel a little a little bit better about their situation. Absolutely. I mean, what, they could be like, what, 27, 28 points? Something yes, like that. 28 points. And, and that's why I said the, yeah. um, the measurement of dominance and evaluation of the performance, I think – I think it's always important, but it's going to be even more important because we don't have any non-conference games to measure these teams or these conferences against each other. So, yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I was just throwing that in. I'm just saying if I'm Texas A&M, then I raise a stink and I bring that up. But if you if you play the round robin between A beats B and B beats C, but C beat A between those three, they've got the – the debilitating loss. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I just like to, to throw out these different playoff scenarios and, you know, see how they play out. I know you probably think, of, think about it from time to time too, right? I, I really don't. What happens is uh, guys like you okay. and other people bring them up to me so often I don't have to think about them. <laughs> I don't have to dream them up myself. <laughs> Which which reminds me, I promised uh, Navy Thomas last night. He called up and said I I needed to get the whiteboard out and draw this up, and so I got to do that. Well, I want to keep you on your toes, Mark. So no, oh, that's why I'm here. Last, last, there you go. Last point on the Buckeye game. It's an early preview of that game. Yep. I'm going to do Buckeye talk this week. Yep. I'll, um, I'll get your comment. Then I got to run to this call. People okay. keep calling. All right, Mark. Well, you take care. Thanks, David. All right. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Yes, who's on the line? Hey, Mark. Yeah. Hey, this is Sean calling from uh, Michigan. Hey, Sean. What's going on? Hey, uh, not much. I have a couple of things to talk about. First off, I'm a huge Cincinnati Bearcats fan here. I'm a... Uh, and I never thought in a million years I'd be running this uh, scenario through. But what needs to happen? I really, I have a really hard time hearing things happen, but seeing anybody in that league beating them this year. What needs to happen for them to get into the playoffs right now? I mean, do we need Notre Dame to beat Clemson again? Is that, like, guaranteed that has to happen to knock Clemson out of the picture? Yeah, Clemson otherwise is just going to win a conference. They're going to be the conference champion, so they're going to get in. They're going to have more respect yeah. from that committee than the Big 12 and the, and the um, Pac-12 champion. Oh, yeah. but So I think we're seeing the pole position kind of like this. It's like Notre Dame can get in by winning out and losing the ACC title game. That would probably put both Ben and Clemson in the top four. I don't see Cincinnati jumping in one loss. Clemson or Notre Dame. True. And I don't really see them jumping a uh, an undefeated uh, Big Ten champion, an undefeated or one loss Big Ten champion, and they're not jumping the SEC champion under any circumstance. True. Yes. So this is a, uh, and I know BYU's in the, in the mix there, but I think because of the schedule they play, since they're the kind of wonky, weird. Uh, 
schedule they played, Cincinnati has a slight edge on them in this playoff position. And I'm um, so I, I don't know. I mean, is that basically what needs to happen? You need the Notre Dame to knock Clemson out of the the playoff picture. So I, I don't like Notre Dame's chance of the game for helping Clemson team at all. I don't either. I think Clemson's going to win the rematch. Um, I think Notre Dame's yeah. really good. I think they're a, a, a really good team, but I think Clemson's better. But Notre Dame beat them fair and square, but Clemson's not healthy. They had three defensive starters out of the game. They had their best quarterback, their number one yep. starter, even though, boy, I would say that Uwe Angelele is probably a top 15 quarterback in the country already. But uh, Trevor Lawrence, I, I know that there were there was one play that sticks out of my head. And if I rewatch the game, I could probably come up with a handful. They're not many, but uh, there was a key play in overtime in which uh, Uwe Angelele took a sack, and Lawrence wouldn't have done that, and that pretty much spelled their doom. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, do you think do you agree with me that Cincinnati kind of has some pole position on BYU right now? In case something yes. weird happens, like oh. you know, do you think so? The schedule's much tougher. Much tougher. Yes. You see, do you see any, I mean, to me, I think the best team in that league outside of them is probably SMU. Uh, maybe not. I mean, Ooh, I think it's really Tulsa. I think year. Tulsa's the best team. What? You think Tulsa? Okay, so that was a COVID postponement. Yeah. They played that. So, so I watched uh, the second half of the uh, Tulsa game against SMU last night. Saw them come back from what twenty four seven down and win twenty eight twenty four. And uh, oh, Tulsa, I, I actually didn't even catch that. Yeah, yeah. That. Tulsa beat Tulsa SMU played, last yeah. night, and uh, Tulsa played a really good game uh, at Oklahoma State. Had a fourth quarter lead in that game. Uh, they've already beaten UCF. I, I don't. I, nobody in the Big Twelve should be good this year. Let's just be, be real. Yeah, I think Oklahoma State's pretty good. I think they're one of the fifteen best teams in the country. Yeah, no. yeah, uh, maybe. I mean, you don't think Oklahoma State they, would win the American Conference? I, I think I, I don't think they beat Cincinnati. I really don't. I think Cincinnati is considerably better than them this year. Considerably better than I, Oklahoma I, State. I, I really do. I think they're they're much they're yeah. stronger defensively. I, wow, they're more complete. They, they make the plays when they need. They, yeah. I mean, you ah. you've you, you seen them the past like the past like four weeks. The teams they play aren't horrible, and they're just, no, I mean, other than East Carolina, Houston, Memphis. I mean, I I can see those teams giving Oklahoma State a competitive game, and Cincinnati just steamrolled all of them. You think Cincinnati you know, like would? You think Cincinnati down. would run the table in the Big Twelve? I don't. Well, I mean, I, I think it's. I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. I, oh, it's possible, I mean, but I, I don't. I mean, I don't see Cincinnati beating I mean, Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma State, TCU, Kansas State, Iowa State. All those teams. Okay, but I just don't think they would. No one in the Big Twelve is doing that either. Everyone in the Big Twelve is lost so far, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, mean, I don't think he, he I don't think really Cincinnati's they're, they're significantly better than Oklahoma State. How how much better do you think Cincinnati is right now than they were last year? Uh, a ton, ton better. I think that I, I think it's it's they got mostly the same players and they're just much more disciplined. They're they're much more skilled. They don't make a lot of the foolish mistakes they made last year. They're more explosive. They're up there. You know, Rivers improved a ton as a passer. And you're not great. He's not going to threaten any of these top teams uh, with his throwing skills, but he's a lot more efficient. I, I think they're I think they're much, much better than they were last year. Okay. I, I can't really comment on that. I saw him play a few times last year. I've not seen him play this year, a few plays here and there. Uh, I just, you know, check out the box scores and so forth. I just don't have time to take in Cincinnati football. I would love to see them play Oklahoma State. I would love to see them play even better teams than that. But 
I just don't see where Cincinnati is significantly better than Oklahoma State. I mean, they're probably on a match of individual talent for talent wise. They, I mean, it's it, they're probably not, but I think they work. I mean, that's not that's not everything in, in college football. I, uh, I mean, I, I liken both BYU and Cincinnati this year to you know, like the Boise State teams of the you know the earlier part of last yep. decade or the, the later aughts. I mean, they're not they're not on the same level with the teams that they're playing, you know, I mean, if, when you're, when you're at that level, you really have to like, just bulldoze people. Yep. To be really, really impressive. And, and Absolutely. Both teams are doing that. Yep. Yeah. I appreciate the call. Got more calls coming in. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football uh, callers were on the line. I thank you for your patience. Uh, I like for people to be able to uh, finish their point. Uh, but uh, don't want the calls to go on forever uh, because I know a lot of people are, have called a number of times and are, are waiting to get uh, your points across. All right. Hey, it's Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey, Tom. How are you? I just want to give you, I just want to, I see you got your pen handy in your hand. I got pen. it. You see me? So I got it. it. So, so get your paper out. Yep. Here you go. I'm going to help them replace Will oh. Mush, Mush, uh, Schmack. Mushmack. Okay. So, yep. There you go. All right. Here you go. Gotcha. I'm ready. Michigan coach. Harbaugh. Harbaugh. Okay. Um, I've got five of them. Frost. Scott Frost. Uh, from Nebraska. Yeah. You no, know, he's not good enough. Okay. Uh, Barents from Iowa. Oh. The Big Ten getting raided. Okay. And. Oh, damn. Now, I just forgot. I just gave you three. Um, the, the Florida coach. The Florida coach? Yeah, Dan no, Mullen? You, you, you freeze. Oh, freeze? Yeah. Put him in there. I think that's your best selection right there. Okay. And then to make the easy trade with the Big Ten, it's just swap him out to, uh, oh, the Indiana, Indiana coach. Oh, I Tom Allen. His name. Tom Allen. Yeah. Okay. Change him out. All right. And Mitch Bagger can go there and they can pick up that coach from wherever and just go with it. Nothing big. I'm just throwing out the ideas out there. Okay. But, you know, I'm all big Ten. Get rid of all of them, so. I got to think that Jim Harbaugh, once he leaves Michigan or gets booted, is going to the NFL. That's my guess. Scott I Frost is staying in Nebraska. going to get canned. Okay, he's going to get canned. You're stuck with Scott Frost for a while. You know that, right? The only, the only thing Frost has done this year is that uh, your guy was talking early in the show where he was talking as a Penn State guy. We had a defense that was playing the five five line frontman from the 10 yards brought back two guys and then they had three further back but they also had the defensive backs um, charging at the same time. So it was over five times. And we shut down Penn State. They couldn't get in. And they got four or eight times. And we had the linebackers breaking up all the passes. So I've, I've watched it over and over and over. And I've just been like, 
where in the hell did teenagers come up with this? But, nah, whatever. It's just better. That 3-4 defense has really worked good against Penn State. So, getting down there inside the 10 and at the 9 and shut them down just impressed me to no end. So, that's all I wanted to bring that up. I will check out that game. I, I was watching want, other I games at noon. Yep. I just okay. wanted to give you a change of the players. Get that Franklin. Get Harbaugh. And uh, the other ones. And maybe they can make a coaching team and go with it from there. So, maybe right, Thomas. Man. Talk to later, buddy. Maybe Thomas. Can you see your screen right now? Can you see the video right now? Yeah, I see you. You see, my, see what I got in my hand? All right, I, I cleaned it off at Perfect. least. That's what you need to work for. Okay, I cleaned it off. Write down, replace, replace that head coach. Oh, no, 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 and no. And you can start writing down the names I just gave you. I, I thought that was uh, for my playoff rundown. Thought you wanted a playoff video. Yeah, but they'll have this done within a week, I think. Okay. All right, Navy. Appreciate it. I figured, yeah, figured you'd get a new board for it instead of the paper. <laughs> okay. No big deal. All right, Tom. Appreciate the call, man. All right, man. Thanks, man. Talk you, to you later. All righty. Good stuff. He was going off on me the other night about maybe Thomas about cleaning off the board so I could uh, break down this playoff situation. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, who's on the line. Hello? Okay. Yes. It's Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Uh, Chase. Hey, Chase. How are you? I've got an idea to solve this playoff. Okay. We've got an eight-game playoff scenario. I thought that would have solved it. Because then it gets the uh, wine and group of five fans to uh, get some of their teams in, like the Brigham Young, Cincinnati, get them in. And I also wanted to know what's your thoughts on the SEC going to a 10 game conference only schedule from here on out? The and, SEC? Um, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the SEC starting at the uh, 10 game conference only. And if you're going to play a cupcake, get it at the end of the year. Yep. He, he is a hot garbage coach. Um, he'll be looking for a new job at the end of the year. Or maybe even in the season. Um, and I think this coach in Harris is going to be willing to remember for a long, long time. I think uh, our ball's out. I don't see he's out. James Franklin is going to find himself without a job at the end of the year. I think Hugh Freeze is probably going to South Carolina. Probably getting the South Carolina just got rid of Will Muschamp. Uh, again, that's kind of what I'm thinking for two trees, although it might go somewhere else, like a more high profile job, like a Michigan or in State. But I think he's going to go to South Carolina to lick his chops in the SEC. And another thing, um, a lot of people keep sleeping on the Gators. I mean, this is, I mean, this is sort of ridiculous. I'm saying Cincinnati. Uh, at the end of a 63-point win against uh, uh, Arkansas, they're putting Cincinnati inside the top five and some of these post-game shows. That's just ridiculous. I mean, Cincinnati's in a group of five conference. I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. All right, Chase. Uh, so you've got the SEC going to 10 games. I'll comment on all this stuff because I'm I'm with you on some of this. College football playoff at eight teams. Mm -hmm. Q freeze to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from just a football standpoint, I think Q freeze to South Carolina makes a lot of sense. Tons of sense. 
Now, I don't know if South Carolina wants to deal with all that they have to deal with, with, with Hugh Freeze showing up there. I, I don't know where they stand on that part of it. Okay, an eight-game, eight-team college football playoff always works. That's the way to go. From the time that this was announced in 2013, that there would be a four-team playoff, and the first person that ever asked me, what do you think of the four-team playoff? I said, well, it's better than having two uh, just because it affords opportunities for two other deserving teams. But this is – the math doesn't work. we got five conferences. we got ten conferences if you want to bring in the group of five. But we've got five conferences. we got four spots. It doesn't work. So we need to go to eight teams immediately. So not just in this mess, this season, but every season we need to go to eight teams. And I've posted a bunch of videos explaining it in depth. Uh, the SEC, so you make a great point here, Chase. So what I love about this is that especially in the ACC and the SEC, the scheduling is a huge factor in who wins because you get 14 teams, meaning that every team has 13 possible opponents. And you only play eight of those, meaning every team misses five other teams in your conference. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's a huge discrepancy in strength of schedule. And that shouldn't exist within a conference. For example, Chase, I did this a few years ago. This was about, this was quite a few years ago when I first started to harp on this. And I've built a whole scheduling format that would reduce this issue. There was a season, Chase, in which, okay, Alabama and LSU obviously compete in the SEC West. They're competing for the same thing. And they both play the other five teams in the division. So, and they play each other. So six of their games are exact. Okay. The other two games in, in this particular season, the other two games, Alabama played two teams, Tennessee and Kentucky, that the previous year both went one and seven in the SEC. So Alabama was playing two teams in the East who went two and 14 the year before. LSU was playing Georgia and Florida who tied for the Eastern division title at seven and one. So LSU was playing two teams that went 14 and two the year before. So if you don't, if that's not a competitive disadvantage, I don't know what is. That's ridiculous. Well, well, like a lot of my friends that are actually, that are LSU fans, they've been harping on this idea for years. Why does Alabama play the bottom of the barrel on Tennessee who barely wins in football games? And then LSU's got to face both Georgia and Florida who at a consistent rate compete for SEC, SEC East titles and go normally 7-1 or 7-0 and by the time of that game. It's just ridiculous. I mean, they've been... You know, if, if, when I'm a herd the firebomb show, you'll hear them call in and, and complain about that. And it's obvious complaint that, in, in, you know, I'm not going to hop on that bandwagon yet, but the common bandwagon is that the SEC shows favoritism towards Alabama because of this quote unquote Nick Saban dynasty, because that's all their Golden Boy team that they can get in the playoffs. I'm not going to be on that bandwagon, but the. The LSU fans that have stated that, I can see their reasons and reasons why. Why did they have to pay Florida and Georgia, who had a consistent race, go for go to the SEC championship? Yet Alabama's got a Tennessee chunk change, the garbage team, and South Carolina in the chunk change garbage team. Uh, so, oh, you know, okay, Chase. So I agree with half of what you're saying, but the other half is rotational. So. Alabama plays, as you well know, Tennessee every year, and LSU plays Florida every year. But the other ones are on a rotation. So Georgia, uh, LSU doesn't have to play Georgia any more than Alabama has to play Georgia. It's on a rotation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it just—it just seems to me like Alabama gets away with murder playing in just a garbage Tennessee. Sure. LSU's got to face. Florida every year. Well, Auburn's got to play game Georgia game. every year. Auburn's got to play Georgia well, every year. Yeah, and that just doesn't make any sense. Why does Alabama get away with murder, and yet they go, <laughs> they go to a national title game? Whenever they're in, if you look at their schedule, 
they're playing at least teams that suck. Well, so whoa, whoa, whoa. Suck. wait a minute. Again, they that that's only because of Tennessee. They don't play the teams that suck any more than anybody else does. It's in a rotation. They played Georgia this year. Yeah, but in large part, that was because of some game. You know, quote unquote, COVID. No, they were already scheduled to play Georgia. They play Georgia every seven, six years, just like everybody else plays Georgia every six years, except for Auburn's got to play them every year. Okay, so I get and your, I, I totally agree with your point. I, to, I agree with half of your point that Tennessee's been horrible for 13 years. Generally, they had a couple nine and four seasons, but basically they've been bad for 13 years. And, and Alabama's had the benefit of playing them every year because that is a designated rivalry in the SEC, just like Auburn and Georgia is and LSU and Florida is. What about Ole Miss? They get to play Vandy every year. That's not fair. And, you know, because they better belts than uh, the Tennessee has been yet another Tennessee. I mean, they've been bottom of the barrel just like old uh, Tennessee. Well, Tennessee. even even worse than Tennessee. <laughs> and their coach will be finding a new job at the end of the year. So that's a child's point. I mean, I think this team game going forward is the way to go. I mean, I, I was a huge fan when it announced. We ain't got to deal with, oh, like last year with LSU. Oh, the big things, uh, like a UT Martin team, little FCS team, they didn't play a hard road schedule like Kyle Trask is playing this year. I think it removes that argument. And I, I think, yeah, if you want to bring back the Florida, Florida State rivalry, put that at the end of the year. They can do it. Florida's got to run the gauntlet and then get that game. And, and let's be quite frank and quite frank and blunt and honest. And Florida State has been hot garbage. Does, does anybody really want to see that just murdering, quite frankly, of, uh, of Florida State? But but do you want to see us kill rivalries just because the team's bad for a few years? Four four years I mean, four years ago, Florida State was a top ten team. So we, yeah. we can't we can't look into the future and say, well, we're going to kill that game because Florida State's going to be awful in three years. We we didn't know that. I mean, yeah, but with the ten game, I would push that one game, that one rival game at the end of the year. They and do play at the end of the year. Florida has to go. They they do play at the end of the year. Florida and Florida State well, do play at the end well, of the year. My argument is. Kill off FCS teams entirely from playing a top okay. 10 team just to go in and there's an injury. I mean, you really look at a lot of these FCS uh, teams that face a, a top five uh, team and the SEC, they become injury games. And it's just ridiculous. Um, I think all the big rivalries, non conference rivalries, push them all the way to here, like they have been, that make the 10 games go all the way to the end of the year. Gotcha. I appreciate the call, man. I'm going to take these other calls. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. All right. Uh, yeah, 10 games in the SEC. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, Nick Saban actually says, let's go for nine. And I agree with that. Uh, nine games in the SEC, just like three of the other four conferences. And you still got uh, three other non-conference games. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey man, what's going on? Uh, not much. I'm hearing about that last caller complaining about how that point Tennessee every year. Well, I, I understand Tennessee's not been good for 13 years, but he was he was kind of saying it was Alabama's fault. It's not Alabama's fault. They there's a, there's a rival. There's a reason that Alabama and Tennessee play every year, just like there's a reason Auburn and Georgia play every year and LSU and Florida. The issue I have is that they match up the other teams, uh, Ole Miss Vandy, Mississippi State, and Kentucky, and Texas A&M, and South Carolina, and Arkansas, and Missouri, and for no reason. They're, those are made up yeah, rivalries. Arkansas, they don't. I, I remember Arkansas used to play South Carolina every year, and I don't think my just kept that. It's like Texas A&M played Missouri. Uh, I, I think they did that, I'm guessing, because they wanted Texas A&M and Mizzou 
to feel more a part of the league. Like they didn't want to kind of sanction them off as being the two newbies that played each other every year. That's what I'm guessing. And they wanted to kind of build Arkansas and Missouri as some kind of rivalry. That's my guess because they play the uh, Friday after Thanksgiving now in place of what used to be, as you well know, Arkansas and LSU. Yeah, and uh, I know uh, on band of schedule next year uh, they play Florida, but I wish they would do like the like Big Ten doing like a nine game uh, conference schedule where yep. they they couldn't you know. Yeah, I think that's uh, the way to go. Because the way it stands right now, um, you're you're rotating against six teams. Therefore, uh, take Alabama, for example. They don't see Georgia for six years. They played them this year. Well, this year is going to be a little bit different because they added the two games. But basically, if you played somebody in 2020, you're not going to see them until 2026. And uh, I got to ask about the top Well, sure. It's always wise to bring in Urban Meyer. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, yeah. you know, Bowling Green, Utah, Florida, Ohio State. We see the pattern there. Uh, I don't know if he yeah. has any. Uh, first of all, I'm going to take the man at his word that that he's not going to coach. Although he said at his closing news conference with Ohio State that he he didn't say that I will never coach again. I guarantee it. He he, he left the door open. But I think he would be more in line for Texas or USC. I think that's more of his stature. Uh, I think, uh, do you think uh, Vanderbilt will fire Derek Mason this year? I think they should. I don't understand keeping him around. I don't get it. He's been there for seven years, and they've been awful. And I understand the expectations can't be as high as they are at other places in the SEC, but still going one and seven in the SEC, like every year. And he had one, he, he's had two bowl teams and they lost both bowl games and finished six and seven. So he hasn't had a winning season. The coach before proved that you can go five and three in the SEC and go nine and four. And I know that the East was a little bit weaker then, but still, I, I just think that they have just, not progressed at all. In seven years, they've gone downhill, if anything. I would get right. rid of him. Yeah, and I got a question about Michigan. If Michigan does get rid of Jim Harbaugh or he leaves, do you think they'll go after Les Miles? Uh, well, they did, of course, uh, 13 years ago in 2007. They wanted him. I would not go after Les Miles if I was Michigan. I would just think that they could go younger and somebody who's actually shown in recent years that they're, you've got to be so highly energized and motivated to recruit. And Les Miles is now about three to four years removed from like re really having to recruit at a super, super high level. Mac Brown's doing it though. So to your point, if Mac Brown can do it, and he's busting his tail recruiting, uh, and they're doing a great job at North Carolina, eh, maybe. Uh, Les Miles, I always thought, was a great fit at LSU, did a nice job. He's a he's not a game manager, clock manager. He's awful at that, but everything else, he, he does well as a head coach. The kids love him. They that run that through a wall for him. Now, does Ogeron survive at LSU is he over? Is he done? 
No, no, I'm just asking does he survive the the, uh, the fire uh, phase because I know a lot of people say they should have ties with them, and a lot of people say he probably did in their season, probably like a Gene Chivet kind of thing. Oh, I'm not firing a coach uh, the year after winning a national championship because he's two and three. And also, Gene Chizik didn't have as successful seasons as Ogeron had prior to that. You know, they finished in the top 10 and won the Peach Bowl the year before that. And they went to the uh, Citrus Bowl and had a decent team, a top 15 team the year before that. Chizik basically went seven and five, won the national championship, and then lost Cam Newton, and they fell apart. Uh, thanks. Appreciate the call. All right, all right, all right. Uh, we've got uh, S702. Why are people saying Matt Campbell from Iowa State when has Iowa State been a consistent winning top 20 team? Uh, well, you got to look at the resources. It's similar to what Northwestern does under Pat Fitzgerald, which is phenomenal what he's able to accomplish there. Northwestern is um, a difficult place to win. So is Iowa State. Iowa State has never won anything. They've always won three to four games. And Matt Campbell's winning seven or eight a year. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hello? Okay. Somebody's listening. Somebody was listening to me and they were not responding to the phone call. Uh, I appreciate you listening to me, but when you make the phone call, please turn down the, um, yes, Dominic, uh, Cheryl, thank you so much for reminding me, uh, Dominic, thank you so much for the super chat contribution. Hopefully you're still watching. Appreciate that so much. Uh, hopefully we provide uh, solid content here. Our mission, I'm not going to say we deliver every day. We do our best every day. But we're here every day, live streams almost every day, call-in shows and the like. But the mission is to provide the best in discussion, debate, and analysis of college football. And a better call-in system at some point. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, Mark. Sports Sport. How are you doing? Hey, McD. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. I'm this point of Maryland play this weekend for the COVID um, cases. Um, but we were, I mean, and I did want to play a higher state, but I don't understand why a bunch of delusional Maryland fans think that we were going to beat uh, a higher state this year. We weren't going to beat a higher state, so, um, I don't know why a bunch of Maryland fans are upset that, uh, we, because we had a shot at a higher state, but, um, uh, uh, I, I was... want to talk about three things. Let me, let me just uh, comment there. I was looking forward to watching that game just because I thought it was going to be entertaining from an offensive standpoint. And I could have seen that game being 45-31, 48-31, you know, something where it's entertaining and Maryland's kind of in the game and it's not a blowout by any stretch. I think it would have been – they uh, Maryland's shown me enough uh, the two previous games that I think that they would have made plays with uh, – with Raheem Jarrett and Demonte Demas and and uh, Funk and so forth and and Talia throwing the ball, so I think it would have been a fun game. I thought they would have lost like three touchdowns, but it could have been trying to shoot out with Kyle kind of shoot out like uh, the first subject I want to talk about the uh, South Carolina Gamecocks uh, firing a head coach Will Muschamp. Uh, and uh, before before I talk about that. Let me talk about the game real quick. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin mm -hmm. should have been penalized for throwing his clipboard into the stand. That should have been a 15-yard penalty. I don't know why it wasn't. You cannot be using props for celebration. Technically, that was a prop throwing his clipboard. So, I I, I'm going to have to look that up. Penalty. 
Uh, I was on here live after all the primetime games last night, and I saw all these comments about clipboard, clipboard, clipboard. Was that on the touchdown that they scored from 91 yards out? Yeah. Okay. I missed that. I saw that he, he signaled for the touchdown way before the quarterback, Matt Corral, threw the ball, that he knew the guy was wide open. They blew the coverage. It was going to be this long touchdown. But I, I didn't see him throw the clipboard. Yeah, that should be a penalty. <laughs> do, do we really want coaches throwing clipboard? Like, if, if I'm a coach, the next game, I'm just intentionally just throwing a clipboard and seeing what happens. And then if I get if yeah. I get a 15 year penalty, I'm going to say, well, we need to be consistent. Uh, I I was under the assumption that uh, this was fine in this league to throw clipboards. Yeah, I mean. And he threw the clipboard once the guy caught the ball. Like, he wasn't even in the end zone. Like, it was a funny celebration, but that needs to be penalized just because for the, just for the, uh, just for consistency. So I just want to bring that point up real quick. It might be an improper opinion, but it is the right opinion. But, uh, I thought they were going to keep, keep much shut through the young um, team. I thought maybe after this game, you would have hey, we're going to move him in a uh, different direction after this season, but if you want to stay around, and coach the final three games, but um, I, they made the right move at the end of the day because much chance special team was defense in the past three games, uh, especially the old Miss game. The, the defense was South Carolina was embarrassing uh, to say the least. And real much champ, uh, I know some people were saying, uh, "Oh, we should pray for his family and all that." He'll be fine. He'll get. Uh, he'll be one of the top paid defensive coordinators in the country. Now, who I think should replace uh, Will Muschamp? It sounds like it's going to come down to two candidates. It sounds like it's going to be Hugh Freeze and the Louisiana head coach and Billy Napier. I want to first see Napier because I think it's kind of more of a safe hire because Hugh Freeze will bring some controversy. Now, Hugh Freeze, I think, would be the better hire because um, he would, uh, that's a name that people re would recognize, and maybe he would bring something to that program. But I want to mention a name that no one has mentioned, and he might not want to be a head coach anymore, and it's not Urban Meyer, and, but he might not want to be a coach anymore, but he did, he, right, at the two programs he was at, he did a lot of winning, maybe didn't end the way people wanted it to end at the second program, or the first program, but he did a lot of winning, and he's familiar with the SEC, and that is Mark Rick. If he wants to, if he has any interest in coaching, if, if, if uh, South Carolina finds out, they should be giving him a phone call immediately, in my opinion. Mark Rick, I thought was going to do good things at Miami. I, I didn't expect him to win national championships, but I thought, and, and of course he showed us in his first two years that he was headed on that path. They were recruiting uh, he brought in a eighth ranked class. They went nine and four, then 10 and three and uh, went to the orange bowl. And then it just became this uh, circus with his son uh, coaching on the offensive staff and, and him being uh, so tied to that and uh, messing around with the offense. Mark Richt um, could have had a successful run at um, Miami. So I would agree with you if he has learned his lesson and would, would hire a top-notch offensive coordinator with an updated uh, offense and stay out of that. He can be the CEO. He can be the, the head of recruiting. Uh, kids love him. He, he knows how to run a football program. He's good with the media. He, he's, he's a CEO type. He's a Bobby Bowden. Of course, he um, has coached with Bobby Bowden. And so, uh, you know, I could definitely see that, but he just kind of seemed uh, tired and worn out uh, at the end of the Miami run. Maybe it was just that situation in Miami. Maybe he would be rejuvenated uh, at being back in the SEC. Well, I, I agree with everything you said, especially in that last part. I know he had a heart attack not long after the uh, Miami, uh, him getting up there at Miami, but um, – but the difference between Miami and South Carolina is Miami's a very demanding job, very passionate fan base. South Carolina, they have a passionate fan base as well. But Will Muschamp would have been gone probably after year three in Miami. I mean, if he was in Miami, just like Rick was gone. He, they let him go uh, four-plus seasons there at South Carolina. 
I think like, if, if Mark Wood comes in, he has some A and five years, nothing will happen to him in South Carolina because that's kind of the norm there, so A and five. So that's why I think I think it's a really good if he has any interest in coaching, if he wants to go back to being a head coach and there's rumors that I think that needs to be the higher that they make. But I would like to see Billy Napier. I don't think they should go after the Coastal Carolina head coach. Only because they only make good for one year. I would like to see him, uh, the Coastal Carolina head coach. Chad will maybe uh, see him a little bit more consistency out. That made two good years. Uh, I know Dave Claus has been being thrown around as well. That won't be a bad hire either, but I don't know if you will want to break four is, but I'm a big fan of Dave Clawson. I'm a Dave Clawson guy. I love Dave Clawson. He's done an exceptional job at Wake Forest. I agree. I don't know if you will want to leave Wake Forest. That's the only thing. <sighs> to go to South Carolina? You, you can only do so much at Wake Forest. And he's he's pretty much maxed out at Wake Forest. I agree. You can only go 7-5 and five or 8-4, like- maybe, at Wake Forest. Uh, We've got a comment coming in from Barf here. This is uh, now. This is a different job, but what do you think of this one? I I think this is a tremendous possibility. Jeff Halfley to Michigan. I well, I'll say this about the Michigan job. Uh, I would think Jim Harbaugh, their his contract will just run out after what, next season, and then they'll just part ways. Then he's being fired at the end of the season after they get their uh, ads handed to them by a higher state. Now, here's the question. Uh, Luke Fickle is out there. I do not think Luke Fickle will go to Michigan because he's a higher kid sure. and he wouldn't want to coach to Michigan. I agree. I don't know where Michigan goes from there. Je- I mean, Jeff Halfley, I know he's been pretty good at Boston College. He's only been there for one year. I need to be more than just one year at Boston College for uh, someone to move up to uh, Michigan. I'd give him an so, interview. I don't know. If I'm in Michigan, I give Jeff Halfley an interview at least. I want to hear what he has to say. I mean, maybe you do that. Maybe if you blows your way, do it. But I think, I don't know. I, I, need, I, I would think at least, at least three years from a head coach before making a determination about him. So... I, I, my opinion is he's only been there one year. I need to see at least another two years with him before I, I, I sit there and say, yeah, he should be the Michigan head coach. So I don't know if he's going hire at Michigan to replace Harbaugh. I, because I think Luke Fingle to me is like the, uh, the only Big Ten job he would take, and at least the uh, Big Ten East is a higher state. I mean, if Turk Barrett retires, he might go take the Iowa job. Yeah. But I don't know who, um, I don't know who Michigan hires. That's going to be extremely interesting to see who they hire. I don't know, it might be a no name. It, it really might be a no name. I don't know who they're going to hire. Um, and Penn State, James Franklin. Um, I don't think it's about James Franklin. I, I don't know if he loses the job, but like in the mailing game, he was lost. He, I mean, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. He just looked lost in that game. But um, I, I feel like Penn State, um, I don't know exactly what's going on up there. But, I mean, he, he looked lost. And I, feel, and I think Herman, I think uh, two things keep you, two teams keep the eye on. One, you did a video on recently. Virginia Tech and Texas are two teams that I think could let go of their head coaches as well. Um, and I think Urban Meyer would go to Texas if that job is open and they, and they give him a phone call. Uh, because he always talks about Texas on the uh, on the uh, on Fox. And um, I, I feel like they need a big name hire there at, at Texas. They need to make a splash. So that's just my opinion about I hear you, McD. That. Good takes. Like it. And I, I, can I get one more? I want to make one more point about uh, Nebraska. Uh, South Falls will not be fired because uh, any Nebraska I know you're doing your, uh, you your new uh, Nebraska stream. Um, Nebraska is weighing the pass. I mean, they are never going to win a national championship again at Nebraska. 
Uh, times have changed. You got to be a big name program and have appeal like a Michigan, like a uh, Texas. Nebraska is in the middle of nowhere and Omaha, and not Omaha, and Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, basically, there's just no appeal to Nebraska anymore. Unlike 20 years ago, people would go play for a coach. Now it's all about appeal. And Nebraska is at best going to be a nine run program for a really long time because of that. That's what I learned this past weekend. Because if Nebraska was any good, they would have ran Penn, Penn State, that, that terrible Penn State team, off the field, and they couldn't. I was my man on church who ran them off the field. So that's what I'm really happy you, Mark. Uh, thanks for my call. Go Terps for being Michigan State next week. Thanks, McD. <laughs> Our guy, McD, always has a, a ton of takes going through the coaching uh, hot seats with me on a regular basis. And now that Will Muschamp's out, maybe that starts the cascade because it was uh, conventional wisdom that this would be a late year for one big reason in two different ways. So the one big reason is, of course, COVID. Man, how many times have we said that word this year? I, I would love to get past this. But anyway, uh, COVID uh, creating two type of thought processes, one being nuts and bolts money. Athletics have been cut at most of these universities. And on top of that, athletic budgets have been cut. And on top of that, uh, revenue has been cut because of less football and no NCAA tournament. Oh, sorry. I cut you off. Whoever just called, please call back. I'm sorry. Hit the wrong button. My train of thought. Less money less revenue. Uh, yeah, so the financial situation not good at these schools to the point where they've had to cancel some sports. They have had to lay people off. They have had to furlough people. They have had to also cut the salaries of certain people. And it's kind of difficult at certain places to say, okay, well, we are forcing all these different people to take a 10 or 15% cut in salary, but we're going to pay this guy off $12 million to hit the road. Uh, so that's kind of a difficult sell. So there's a financial consideration. And then the other consideration is that it's been difficult not having a football team together through spring practice, through summer workouts, and all the issues that we're going to kind of punt the evaluation of this season and, and be kind of light and lenient in our evaluation of the head coach. So those are the two reasons why the conventional thinking was that there would be few firings this fall, but maybe the Muschamp firing and a couple others because there's always a cascade because if if there's one vacancy, then that has to be filled by somebody else. Well, if it's a good job like South Carolina, an SEC job, well, you take a, a group of five coach or another power five and you, you displace them, well, they've got to be replaced. And so it builds, it just creates a cascade of, of coaches unless you bring in somebody who's currently retired. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, who's on the line? Hey, we got Dominic here. What have we got going this year? Hello? <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe that was something uh, of a profane nature that I didn't fortunately hear. I don't know. Didn't get that one. All right. Uh, anything else we need to get to? What if I missed anything? Any questions, any comments for me? Rutgers is going to beat Michigan, according to Ohio State uh, Natty's. Purdue wins 45-49-34. All right, all right, all right. I think that's about it. Uh, we've done enough damage. Uh, we've got uh, conversations lined up with all sorts of uh, bloggers and broadcasters coming up this week, so be looking out for those videos. I will certainly have a number of my takes, as I have in recent weeks, on my stock market, high risers, and teams that are plummeting. 
Uh, should I do a Heisman list? Uh, didn't get many views last week. So that was a waste of time doing Heisman. It's pretty much the same. Trask is going off. Mac Jones, Justin Fields. I threw in some other people. I had a list of honorable mentions. Again, uh, if I do certain videos, even if they get requested, uh, then it becomes a waste of my time if nobody wants to watch a video and they get like 500 views. It's just not worth it. Obviously, the time's got to be justified. Uh, so the Heisman, a uh, couple Heisman lists I did didn't uh, really gain much. So we'll put that aside. Uh, Navy Thomas is wanting some kind of college football eliminator video, I guess we could call it. Uh, so I'll get into that. And uh, of course, we've got a, our live streams coming up. I'm, I, I want to put together a specific live stream schedule. I know that I've got one now and I've been over on SG1 college football uh, a couple times a week, but that's going to cease. I'm going to just supply a ton of content. Uh, if you've noticed, folks, listen up. If you've noticed, We've expanded our channel selection a ton. We have team-specific channels for now the SEC, Clemson, Florida State, Miami, Ohio State, Nebraska, Michigan, Notre Dame, Texas, USC, Oregon. Have I missed any? Those are the ones that come to mind. I think that's all of them. So please, if you want to, get on over there and subscribe, please. Even if you don't like those teams and you just want to help us build, then please subscribe to those channels. I would appreciate it. And always smash that like button. Give us a comment. You can uh, join us on Patreon. We do watch parties. We've got uh, exclusive live streams per request. My predictions. Uh, we get uh, Steve Merrill's pick of the week, his lock of the week each and every week, and an insider look at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and certainly I'll take this call. Why not? I seem to be pretty wired for it being uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, almost. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, who's on the line? Uh, Brad Highland, how are you doing today, my man? Hey, I'm doing well. What's going on? Um... So my question is a little different. Um, I'm a dot art Buckeye, and I just read on, I just seen on the news that it was a few hours ago, Michigan, um, as of Wednesday, is shutting the state down for three weeks, including high schools and oh colleges. Lord. So I'm, I'm immediately thinking, what is that going to do to Ohio State, considering we have to play Michigan State and Michigan, and then our game was just canceled against Maryland. We have to play a minimum of six games just to get to the Big Ten Championship. Well, huh, I'm trying to figure out, uh, depending on what those guidelines state, whether those teams can leave the state and play somewhere else, or they have to quarantine for 14 days or some ridiculous. The, these these rules, uh, I, I don't want this to get political right now, but uh, I, I think they're just pathetic and ridiculous. But anyway... Um, I don't know. Uh, you're calling the wrong guy. I'm not a CDC guy. Uh, I, I don't know. The, I'm sure the Big Ten is talking about those those questions right now. I believe that they're looking at it right now, and they don't want their number one money maker and their one. And sorry, Indiana fans, I'm going to uh, maybe offend you. Their team that's going to make the college football playoff. Uh, I. I they obviously want to make sure that they play the games, and they've already missed one. Right. See, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to turn on ESPN or the Big Ten Network tomorrow morning, waking up to seeing breaking news. You know, I'm just, I mean, I, I can't get that off my mind now for ever since I saw that. Breaking news like uh, a bunch of the games are canceled, maybe yeah. the Big Ten caves in. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, something, yeah, something along those lines, like something. Bad news, you know. I, I I think I just keep thinking Ohio State has to play a minimum of six games just to make it to the Big Ten championship game. Yeah, which means we would have we would have needed because we uh, Michigan State and Michigan are both on our schedule. And what I heard was that they were going to shut the state down until December fourth, and we would have played both teams before then. Yeah, so that's it. I, I think. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I thought the. Uh the Michigan game was on the 12th. Well, is it on the 12th? I think it's on the 12th. Let me see. I think I am wrong. That I was... think you're right. 
Yeah, I think you're right, actually. So this Saturday is the 21st, correct? So they're playing Indiana yes, this Saturday, the 21st. Then you say the 28th is against Michigan State? Right, right. I'm trying to pull up the schedule now. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you, uh, except uh, I could go on a political rant. And it wouldn't be political, but just uh, my observations of this whole uh, situation no, involving right, right. the balance of, of the economy and people's freedom. And uh, I certainly take this, this seriously in regards to it affecting people, but I'm not seeing the, the numbers uh, verify uh, for example, these players started to test positive. We started to get positive tests as soon as these players hit campus the first week of June. We started to hear, oh, there's 13 players at LSU and there's so many players at Clemson and so forth and so on. Okay. Right. I have yet to see the story on a Fox Sports or ESPN or anywhere, and we would certainly see it all over the place, had any one of these athletes had a serious, serious issue, medically, physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. We, we would. We just would. I worked at one of those places for 19 years. I know. We, we, we and, and rightfully so. We, we would see the heart wrenching and the the the, the violence playing. And I'm and I'm being serious about that. Uh, a really heartfelt story because those those are meaningful. And um, this is a serious, um, it's a serious virus, but it is so skewed to the physically compromised by age and by condition that some of these um, guidelines that are being put in place are just not wise to the general public. Right. Right. And uh, I've spoken, I, know, man, I, I have personal relationships with three people in the medical field that have stated to me uh, that the numbers are skewed because of their experiences in hospitals and medical facilities and what they are forced to document. Oh, man. Well, I mean, isn't that, isn't that a fair, you know, it, you know, I don't want to say assumption, but I mean, isn't that fair to to think ahead? You know, with you know, seeing that, you know, watching the governor come on and say that, you sure. know, putting a, a halt to the governor of Michigan. She, you know, she came out and said that she, she put a halt on, you know, the whole state for three weeks, starting Wednesday. And I just, you know, I mean, I just I figured, oh my God, what does that mean for Ohio State playing against Michigan State and then playing against Michigan? Sure, because um, that was one of the reasons the Pac-12 gave originally when they weren't going to play. Is they said, "Well, we got a lockdown in California, we got a lockdown in Washington and in Oregon." So, yeah, which is why I I, I refuse to believe the Pac-12 team is going to make the playoffs this year. I don't care how good Oregon is. I just I, there's no way a Pac-12 team gets to the playoff. Yeah, I, I'm not going to miss the Pac-12 not being in the playoff. I, I personally don't believe the conference is good enough, but I, I do think that if there's a conference champion who's undefeated, that that they, they've earned it to a certain degree, unless there are just overwhelming one-loss teams elsewhere. Uh, so this, uh, this Saturday, we've got Michigan State playing on the road, and we've got Michigan playing on the road. In Maryland and Rutgers, that's this Saturday, and the next Saturday on November 28th, we've got, oh shoot, this keeps going to the national schedule when I want the Big Ten schedule. On November 28th, that weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, we've got, <sighs> keeps defaulting to the national schedule. I keep putting the Big Ten schedule in there. I, I want to say Ohio State is there. We're either playing Illinois or Michigan State. 
at Illinois. Uh, that weekend, I yeah. So, so this is uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah, Ohio State's at Illinois. The Michigan schools play both at home against Northwestern and Penn State on that weekend. So, you know, the Big Ten could just say, uh, well, we're going to play, sorry, Michigan, Michigan State, but because of the stipulations, I wasn't going to be so kind. But anyway, the stipulations, uh, you're going to have to travel. But then again, I don't know what the state guidelines are about. Uh, maybe those football teams just have to leave the state and stay gone for for the next month and play all road games if they want to play football. Yeah, I don't know. Right. right. And, and then you, you keep them quarantined but for 14 games after their last game. I don't know. All right, sir. I appreciate the call. I'm going to take, uh, oh, he took off. Very good. All right, everyone. I think uh, that's about a wrap here at Mark Roger TV, the voice of Kelly football. Keep it locked in. I am going to be um, on Pigskin Pete's show. Well, we've got a show together. It's not his show. It's his channel. Uh, College Football Coast to Coast at noon tomorrow, noon Eastern time with Pigskin Pete. So please join us there. And I'm just going to be recording like a madman over the next couple of days. Of course, I'm going to be here live Wednesday night, first at uh, most likely 2 o'clock Eastern time, Ohio State live right here. Please join our Ohio State channel. Please subscribe there. Uh, all the other channels we've got listed, please. Uh, if you go to the front page of my YouTube channel, then you can just kind of pick them off. And that'd be great if you would uh, subscribe. Uh, whether you, you like that team and are saying, okay, or just want to support the channel. So I appreciate it either way. All right, folks, appreciate it. Uh, all sorts of ways in which you can help us. Uh, doesn't have to be monetarily. Uh, Christmas is coming. I know I drive home this point all the time, but Christmas is coming. And I bet almost all of you will be on Amazon at some point. Just use the link that you find in the description section of any of the videos. Grab that link. Please use it. Same shopping experience. Doesn't cost you a penny. And as George has often said, uh, if you buy like a million dollars worth of stuff, I get like three cents. Do a little bit better than that. And it helps build the channel and uh, pays the electric bill. All right. There we go. Anything else? Good night, everyone. Chase said, thank you for the call. Joseph, thank you. Great show. Anything else I need to get? Michael Hogue, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, Cheryl says she works at nursing homes. Nothing else uh, necessarily new to her. Alabama football fan roll tide. Thank you so much for encouraging people, starting with Cheryl, but it was also Alabama football fan roll tide, whatever it is, football fan roll tide, yes. And other people uh, in the live chat that encourage others to hit the like button. Again, I don't know what that magically does to YouTube, but I am told and it's been verified that it works in the algorithms and we want to get these videos pushed to the suggested videos. So when you're on YouTube, you know what the deal is. You most likely are going to watch the videos that are in that suggested video column. It's been proven. It's obvious that you're going to grab something that's over there. If we can get our videos consistently in that column for college football fans, it will help us grow. Thank you so much for that. We will see you soon. Uh, be locked in on our community page and have those notifications rolling because I will consistently tell you when stuff is coming your way. Thanks, everyone. Yes, get some rest. You too, Cheryl. Get some rest. Great job. Boiler up. Roll Tide. Gotta love college football. Oh, super chat, super chat from somebody. I gotta honor that thing. Chase, thank you so much. Appreciate the call, appreciate uh, your contribution right there. Thank you so much for the super chat contribution, Chase. And I gotta say, Chase, I got to admit this, and uh, Chase Stabler, of course, one of the great uh, Alabama and Oakland Raider quarterbacks and Houston Oilers and New Orleans Saint quarterbacks of all time. Welcome to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And I believe you're a Buckeyes fan. All right, that should do it. Thank you so much, everyone.